So I said in Oneida that I extend my greetings, love, and thankfulness to all of you. I am Chris Cornelius of the Wolf Clan and people of the Standing Stone is the earth that I come from. Um, as mentioned, I'm a citizen of the Oneida Nation of uh, Wisconsin, um, and I'm coming to you from Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, where I'm a professor and chair of the Department of Architecture. Um, so I'll walk through a few projects, but really talking about how um, I do think about my non-human relatives um, in, in the work. And so the project that I started my practice with uh, was the Indian Community School of Milwaukee. Uh, I was asked to be a part of the design team with Antoine Predock. The school was started by three mothers uh, in the late 60s in Milwaukee who were not happy with how their, uh, how basically how U.S. history was being taught to their to their children, um, and so they started this uh, school. Um, it uh, was just the three mothers at first. They started in a church basement. They moved to uh, a U.S. Coast Guard station that was occupied in the late '60s, um, and then eventually uh, purchased this property and uh, created a, a, a much larger school. So it's a K-4 through eight school, um, private school that's endowed um, and so students don't pay tuition they only have to prove native ancestry to uh, to attend the school there's 350 students but it, the school itself is also a center of community so a number of things I could give an entire lecture about the school but um, but one of the main things that that we uh, sort of concentrated on because this is for all 11 tribes in Wisconsin uh, and it isn't just for one specific tribe so we focused largely on cultural values uh, and one of the other things we did with the, with the project is we stripped all the institutional names of things from the program, meaning that they have never ever called the place that they eat the cafeteria. They call it feast. Uh, the place that you enter the building is not called the lobby, it's called community. The theater is called drum. Um, because instilling these cultural values into the naming of the place um, carries on its uh, ex existence. And so this is the student entrance called migration. Uh, so that big event of the students coming into the school and leaving the school every day um, is, is, is part, of, uh, part of all of that. Uh, within the school, we have these tree columns that were harvested from the Menominee Nation in Wisconsin. Um, they're white pines. They're, uh, many of them are over 300 years old, and, and many hold stories of pre-European contact before Europeans uh, were in, in Wisconsin. They were brought down in a ceremony. Uh, they gave their lives to the school and are there to tell the stories for uh, those who are uh, available to listen. If you look at a satellite photo of Wisconsin, you can see the Menominee Nation um, on the satellite photo itself. It looks like a Photoshop or a sort of a glitch, uh, but in fact, they have always sustainably harvested their forest. Um, they have uh, increased the yield of that forest uh, by almost 50% um, through the sustainable harvesting. Um, their standards are higher than the Forest Stewardship Council, so they backed out of their uh, partnership uh, with them. Trees are very important to that culture, and if you can imagine, and I'll show you a, a map in a few minutes of the land base of Wisconsin, but if you could imagine most of Wisconsin looking like that. Um, and so one of the mythologies we've been sold is that this land was, was not managed, that it wasn't uh, a, a part of uh, a, a larger system, that it was a sort of wild frontier, right? Uh, when, when in fact there were very sophisticated societies with economic, social, political systems and, and ecological systems managing, managing this landscape. So one of the things that, that I created with this graphic was to begin to understand um, everything from the surface of the site, below it, and all the way up to the moon to begin to really look at the fact that when we're intervening in this landscape, that we're, we're intervening in a system of reciprocities and that there are lessons from our non-human relatives to, to learn. Um, how do they burrow into the earth and why do they burrow into the earth? Uh, what are the migratory patterns of, of things that are crossing the site? Uh, butterflies, uh, migratory birds, eagles, geese, uh, robins, cardinals, those kinds of things, sandhill cranes, uh, which actually migrate from Wisconsin to where I am in New Mexico. Um, and so I say hello to them and send them a uh, message back to Wisconsin when they go back in the, in the spring and summer. Um, but, but also uh, where airline traffic happens, where are seasonal winds and which directions are they coming from, where is space travel happening, where are the satellites crossing, um, the sky all the way up to the moon um, and the moon is our grandmother 
and beginning to think about, uh, when we, again, when we, when we intervene in that system as, as designers, that we're not just putting a building on a site, and we're not just making a place for people, um, that we're actually making uh, a place that, that has to reconcile itself with, the, where, with where it is. Um, and so this is an image that I created out of a series of those. Uh, we created uh, graphic translations of the cultural values. So within this particular one, the, the migration is on it, um, dance is on it. Um, uh, the resonance of, of music, or the oral tradition, all of those things are a part of that, and then the, the naming of the spaces. But this idea of uh, indigenous value of relationality, um, that we think of things as if we are related to them, right? This is why we call the earth our mother, uh, the moon is our grandmother, the sky is our father, the stones are our grandfathers. Um, we be, this is we literally mean that, uh, and so when we think about that, and all of every living thing is our relative, um, and we begin to to think about that, I think that we should be thinking about about architecture in a similar way. So in many indigenous cultures, not just not just my own, but and not all, but we think of plants as our oldest relatives. Um, they have seen good growing periods, bad growing periods, drought. Uh, some of them are food, some of them are medicine. They keep coming back. Um, they have a resilience that, that is, uh, was always around us. But I, I believe that we should be thinking about buildings as our youngest relatives. These things that we're putting into the world um, and the responsibilities we have uh, with them. They live, they breathe, they sweat, they produce waste, uh, they consume a lot of energy. Um, if we thought of them as our, as our relatives, I think we would be thinking about these things differently, right? And, and how we are putting architecture into the world is, is really how, um, how I think as an indigenous designer, I'm thinking about it uh, and my responsibilities of putting physical things into the landscape and, and why they're there. So this project uh, started my practice in 2003. Uh, the school opened in 2007. Um, so I'm going on uh, 20 years with them, which is hard to believe, but um, they're still a client of mine. Uh, and, and I'm currently working on a master plan for their entire campus. They own over 200 acres around the school. Uh, one of the first things that we did uh, in that exercise is we did an ecological survey of the entire site um, to know that because most master plans this I, I don't even like the term master plan I haven't thought of an alternative term but most of master plans are, are approaching sites as if they're empty and we're gonna put things in it right and so in this case I want to see it as this place is actually full and how do we work with the things that are already in it um, I said to the ecological experts like if we're one flower and one bit one bug away from this being the Sand Hill Crane capital of the Midwest, we wanna know what it is and we wanna be able to do that. We've already started thinking about uh, the trees that fall and the habitats that are created uh, within, that, uh, within that site and actually um, using that to emphasize and build those things and that's our way of, of giving back to our non-human relatives on the site. I did a series of speculative works um, after that project and, and most of it was really just thinking about what if I was thinking about architecture for an, in an indigenous way, but not in a metaphorical way, right? Like the thing doesn't mean a thing, right? Like there's a, sometimes I show it in my lectures, but there's a elementary school on my reservation that looks like a turtle. Um, and so, because the turtle is a part of our creation story and it's important to our culture. But what if I stopped thinking about things in that way? What if I also wasn't clear about uh, who or what made this thing? Um, but I'm only concerned with the, the thing that made it um, has a very tacit understanding of, of nature. Um, and so I started making these models um, and instead of using people as the scale figures, I use animals. Um, this one is a, is a space just to look at the moon uh, and I'm being uh, intentionally unclear whether it's a person that's looking at the moon. Uh, is this elk looking at this thing because it just happened upon it? Um, or is it proud of it? Did it make this thing? Did it help make this thing? Uh, is it related to this thing? Um, beginning to really think about the power of architecture in the landscape. Um, I won't go into the story, but there is a, a, a story about the reservation that I grew up on and this building that was on my reservation is one of the first ways that I began to get fascinated with architecture and the power of architecture. All the children in the, on the res were, we were scared they were afraid of this building. We didn't go too close to it because of, because of other sort of mythologies um, that I believe are true. Uh, but I was really captivated as a young person, like, wow, this is amazing. Uh, 
that this is, this is about architecture. Um, so some of these things uh, started as, as drawing. Some of them are three-dimensional sketches, meaning I'm, I'm making it as I'm building it. Um, was really interested in the materiality of, of soldering these things together and um, using brass, bronze, copper, copper mesh, um, and patinating it in a, in a specific way, thinking about what if the cladding was like the feathers of an eagle? Uh, what if I started playing with the moray pattern that was made from these screens or meshes? What if I built it in a box that was intended to open and close but could never close again? Um, I started making it in these found boxes because they're like sites. They have histories, they have uh, contingencies. When we're given a site as, as an architecture, usually you can't make it bigger or smaller. You have to deal with what, what, with what you have. That then began to extend in, in a series of drawings that I did that I call the moon domiciles. And they're, t they're um, named after the moons in my tribe's calendar. Um, and so we have moons that are named usually by things that are happening in the environment. They're associated with the ceremony. Um, and so not all tribes have these, but, uh, but many do. Um, there's usually 13 because there's 13 new moons um, in the lunar calendar. And so again, I was trying to make things that weren't metaphors for the moon name. Um, this is the thunder moon. What is the clap of thunder that wakes up the trees to, in, in order to give it sap, to tell, it, tell the trees to give sap to us uh, happened in the middle of the night? What if it happened when I was sleeping? I would need an apparatus at the top of it to, to hear that. Uh, and that's like a deer's ear. Uh, the deer has, has ears that face forward because it's largely prey. It needs to hear its predators coming. Um, and so when I was doing these drawings, I did a whole series of them. Um, and uh, if it comes into my mind, I put it in the drawing. So this idea of the deer and didn't start the sort of thing, but it was the extension of the way that I was thinking about it. And you can also see too that I continued to use animals as the, um, as the scale figures. In this one, the bear is pulling out this irrigation system to, um, to irrigate its landscape. Um, and the top of it is like uh, the wing of a bird um, and, and the other animals there are uh, there to exist within that landscape. Um, this one is, is, is the, the hunting moon. Uh, and what if it was like a veil that we, we saw this thing, uh, this creature. I'm also interested in these things. You can see each one of them, they take up the same volume. They're displaced from this, the ground the same amount. They have these antennae that, that may um, connect with one another, but they also have different structural uh, conditions. One, is, this one has these legs. Um, th did it look like it's, it's ran there and it stopped? Is it moving when I turn around? Uh, when I'm not looking at it is, it, is it following me? But I did these series of drawings um, by hand in my sketchbook, um, and I was making uh, rhino models of them initially just to get the shade and shadow right on these elevations. But then I started to decide, well, why don't I start to digitally render these things differently? Uh, what if I change the way that I'm digitally rendering? So I'm not just using the human eye level camera view, and I'm not just concerned with all the materials and things being specific, but what if I was rendering possibilities? In this one, it's a structure that has hair instead of columns. What if it was like porcupine quills, right? It's structural hair that it has. And what if I rendered it from the wolf's eye point of view, that the hair is almost poking it in the eye. It, it gets close enough to the thing, but what if the wolf can see things in the sky that I can't. Um, we know that birds can see things that, that we can't. Birds can see magnetism, right? They fly towards it and away from it. Um, they, they can see things in, in nature. But what if, the, what if the wolf could see things um, differently and, uh, and, and was, was, we were able to sort of render that visible? And so I started to, to uh, digitally render these things differently. I did this installation uh, as a part of an artist residency at a uh, children's literature garden in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, which was just north of Milwaukee, where I used to, used to live. Um, and I wrote this proposal uh, to examine the role of the trickster in indigenous storytelling. The trickster is there, and it's usually an animal. It's not always an animal. Sometimes it's a person. Sometimes it's some other phenomenon. Sometimes it's a shapeshifter. Um, but the trickster is there to teach us about our own humanity. Uh, the trickster does things uh, within the story that are, might be related to gluttony or greed uh, or things like that. Um, and we see the consequences of what happens to the trickster within the story. Sometimes we don't, but sometimes we do. Uh, and th and the, the role of the trickster is there to teach us about, about our own humanity, who we are. So when you hear these stories as a child, they're entertaining, um, you, you listen to them, but as you tell them, as you grow old and um, you, you gain wisdom, you begin to understand the messages that, that um, it is telling you. So I made it out of um, 
out of trees that were harvested on the site. Um, and I wanted the children to be, make, basically make their own stories about the thing. Uh, being intentionally unclear about program and form uh, with the thing, and it has a subtitle, it's not a teepee, because while I was making this thing, everyone came by and asked me, what are you making, a teepee? Uh, no, it's not a teepee. Um, but, uh, but it's made in a way that is, uh, to me, uh, incorporating indigenous knowledge uh, and incorporating indigenous techniques and, and ways of, of thinking. I actually erected it like a teepee is erected. I had three poles that were loosely tied together on the ground, and then I erected these large trees, uh, a couple of them are over 30 feet tall, um, together uh, and, and put uh, this copper mesh on it. The copper mesh is exactly the same mesh that I was using in the model. Um, and I was just using it at full scale. But I also began to think about um, what if architecture could have regalia? And I was exploring that in those models as well. Like how does the thing meet the sky? And really thinking about indigenous regalia as being more than aesthetic. I call it hyper ornament because it not only is uh, beautiful and ornamental, but it also tells you things about who you are, where you came from, where you belong. So on the right is the headdress of, of one of my uh, uh, tribe, our, our cultural group, uh, the Haudenosaunee, we're part of a confederacy, the Oneida are part of a confederacy with Seneca, Cayuga, Mohawk, Onondaga, uh, Oneida, Tuscarora. Uh, we are the longest existing working democracy in the world, um, still existing. Our U.S. Constitution is largely based on this confederacy. There is evidence of both Franklin and Jefferson uh, in, uh, researching it. But when I look at this gastoe, it's called a gastoe, I know that it's mohawk because it has three feathers up. If it had two feathers up and one feather down, I would know that that was Oneida. If it was one feather up, I would know it's Onondaga. Uh, when I look at it also, I see antlers, and that means that it's a, it belongs to a chief. Um, and the chiefs are elected uh, in, our, in our confederacy. It's not hereditary. There are a group of elder women who um, basically validate the men who are right for leadership. Um, this is why I think there's an electoral college that doesn't have any explanation. Um, but, but, but we're a matriarchal um, culture uh, and, and, and society. So, so women made those larger decisions and before the democratic process took place. Um, but you can see that everything on it, or most everything on it, are, is from our non-human relatives. These are gifts. Right? These are gifts that our non-human relatives give us uh, in order for us to exist uh, within, within the world. So uh, my friends at Spirit of Space made this film of the piece um, in the winter, is it like February-ish of, of 2019. So I didn't tell them anything really about the thing other than the sort of basics that I just explained to you. So I didn't tell them how to make the film or what story I wanted to tell. They're amazing storytellers. They've made a couple films for me. Um, but what I was so struck by, a couple of things. One was they showed me things about the regalia I was putting on it. I didn't think about it, the sort of correspondence with the pine needles of the tree that was directly adjacent. I wasn't really thinking about that at all. Um, but also they filmed it in a way that it, they treated it as if it's alive and if you get too close to it, you might scare it uh, and, and chase it away. Um, and I, I love that it's only one minute. It's like a trailer for a film. Uh, one of the young women that w was there, she didn't know I was the, the person building this thing and I asked her what she thought of it. And uh, she, she said to me, well, it looks like it's from a movie that I haven't seen yet or 
it's like animals came and built this thing and then humans came later like i, I said yeah probably um but she got it right she understood uh what 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 the piece was and 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 why why it was there um i was asked to make a permanent land acknowledgement at lawrence university in appleton wisconsin it's a small liberal arts college uh, in wisconsin um, the campus has uh acknowledged the fact that the campus exists on menominee land um, it's a like i said a very small private school um, and it won the, the, this past year, the Architects Newspaper Best of the Design Award for social good, actually. And it's called Ot Otachia, which means crane in the Menominee language. So just as I explained myself, and I, I should say introduce myself in my own language, um, that does a number of things. For me personally, it prepares me for what I'm about to do. This, to me, this is a ritual that I am performing right now. Um, but also, uh, when I do these pieces, and I did the, my piece in Columbus, I, I'm not showing, it's also called Wikiami, which is in the Miami language. The land needs to hear the language. The land heard the language of indigenous people for thousands of years, and then it went silent, right? And it rarely hears it. So it's really important to me that these things have these languages. And um, whether it's an indigenous person or non-indigenous person, just talking about the title of the piece, at least the, the land is hearing the language. So this is, is that same satellite photo of Wisconsin. The, the lighter green area is the land base of the Menominee. Um, this is how much of the state they had existed within, and it includes Milwaukee, Green Bay, uh, at, but is north of Madison. Um, and if you recall where I showed where the reservation is. This is where uh, Lawrence University is in, in Appleton. And so one of the first things that they did, this major plaza next to the library, um, they renamed it with a Menominee name, and then they uh, commissioned me to do this piece um, because they wanted, again, they wanted this permanent land acknowledgement. Um, and I, I selected this site because it has a sort of central uh, uh, place within within the campus um, right to the left here is a major sort of green quad that most uh, American campuses uh, have and and so this particular piece is um, is pointing towards the Menominee Nation with the, the uh, reservation boundary of where, where it is now um, it's made of weathering steel it has a custom perforation pattern that's based on uh, a Menominee pattern um, and so when you look at indigenous art, you can usually tell a lot of things about, about the, the people. And in particular, you can see how they see nature. Uh, the Menominee have this interesting, I think, aesthetic um, language when it comes to nature because they both use things in an abstract geometric way and they use these sort of curvy um, shapes of, of showing things. So I used one of the sort of geometric things to create this uh, perforation. Um, it was important to me that you can get inside the piece, um, that you can uh, experience it from, from the inside. Um, but most importantly, it's really, uh, to me, uh, and I worked with their indigenous student group on the campus, that they have something to identify with in these places of higher education where nothing in their world reflects them, right? Uh, none of the buildings, nothing physically in their landscape, in their existence, um, is something that they can um, relate to, and this piece they can. Um, and so they have used it for their gatherings. Um, this is an image from their Instagram uh, where they were having a demonstration about missing and murdered indigenous women and children um, w in it. But, but they have a place uh, now on the campus that they can associate with. Um, and I could tell you that as a person that moved from a reservation to a major metropolitan area to go to, the, to, go to college, it is a scary thing. Uh, so people, if people ask me if I ever studied abroad, I say, yes, I left the res and I went to Milwaukee. Um, and that's where I studied abroad. Um, but it is, that is the case for, for most young indigenous people. Um, they're leaving their communities, particularly here at Lawrence University. They're very good. They have a program that reaches out to indigenous youth across the country. Uh, so a lot of their indigenous students aren't actually from Wisconsin. They're from uh, Texas and Oklahoma and other, other places. Uh, but they now have this thing that they can identify with um, on their campus. And for me, this is really an, an important thing that, that I have uh, been able to 
to, to uh, create for them. One of the unintentional uh, effects of the perforation, uh, which I think is, is remarkable, is that I hadn't thought about the pattern and you being inside it. So when the light comes through, uh, it actually projects all into the space. It projects onto you, onto your body. Um, and so people have been using it, like the students were using it as, as part of their sort of Instagramming. But, um, but I'm uh, currently designing one for Marquette University in Milwaukee, and I've talked to a few other universities to do this. But I will say that the physical land acknowledgement is only another step beyond the verbal land acknowledgement, right? The verbal land acknowledgement is just saying, um, basically when you apologize to someone and say, I'm sorry, this is what I did, right? The next steps have to go into, how am I changing my behavior now? How, are, how is this world going to be different, and what plan have I made in, in making this different. I think, for me, at least as a designer, uh, and beginning to think about how these things work within universities. Universities and colleges have unique land relationships, right? The campus is a very unique construct of, of land. Um, they can be the leaders in giving land back because there are more ways to give land back other than deeding it to indigenous people. Um, there are stewardship. There are other ways of seeing uh, indigenous people within it. So what if your campus had a new chemistry building that was designed by an indigenous architect that was all about how does this thing fit into this ex existing landscape? And it was based on indigenous values and it was stewarded through indigenous values as, as well. So that's a way that the universities can participate in this, right? Um, we're going through a, um, a uh, strategic planning exercise in, in our uh, school at, at UNM. And so one of the first things I said is that we have to not only acknowledge the land, but we have to acknowledge the role of higher education in how we got where we are, right? Higher education was basically invented for privileged white males. Um, and it has been complicit in the system of, of colonization. Um, and, it, and it has uh, held on to that privilege for so long um, that it, be, it becomes very difficult for, for that to change. So we have to acknowledge that as well, but we can be the leaders in, in how we begin to decolonize and deconstruct these uh, larger systems um, that are separating people um, from, from one another. Also separating us from nature, right? Colonization is, is fundamentally the separation of things. It is saying like, this land now is ours, that there was no culture, uh, ecology, or anything there. Ours is now the, 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 the dominant culture. And so anything that separates, right, from human to human, human to non-human, human to building, building to non-human, any of those separations need to be um, as sort of uh, permeable as, as, as possible. Um, this, this last project I'll show you is uh, one of my most recent projects. It's called Not My Hud House. I was one of five designers um, asked by Crystal Bridges to uh, develop a, a full-scale prototype that addresses housing. And so I wanted to address indigenous housing. This has been the thing that's been the sort of undercurrent of my work ever since I just basically decided to be an architect, I think. This is the Hud House I grew up in. Uh, this is the current Google Street View, so it's actually an improved version of what I, what I grew up in. Um, but when I grew up here, I think it had a lot to do with why I became an architect without even knowing it. I decided to become an architect in this house, I should also say, right, uh, when I was 14. Um, but the things that I didn't have the intellectual sophistication to uh, articulate were things like, why, are, why don't we have sidewalks? There's no trees. Why is my house the same as my neighbor's house? Uh, but why are they not lined up? Why, when I go to high school at a non-indigenous high school 10 miles away, and I'm riding my bike in my friend's neighborhoods, their houses are all nice and next to each other. Their yards are respectful. They uh, have trees and sidewalks, and people are walking around. Like, that's not happening at, at where I live, right? This doesn't have a garage. It has gutters on it, but it did not have gutters on it when, when I lived there. Our basement leaked. Um, it doesn't have a porch. It doesn't have a connection to the ground. So when I developed this, this um, sort of notion, um, at, I taught us, when I taught the studio at, at Yale, um, we were working in the upper right community, the Opusquai Cree Nation in, in Manitoba. Um, and I told these students that here's one of the things about indigenous housing. It's almost literally the same house everywhere. US, Canada, Canada, Southwest, Midwest, 
Great Plains, same house, same 1,200 square foot, three bedroom home. Um, this is a form of colonization. This is a form of uh, trying to assimilate us into living in a very particular post-war way, right? Um, so what happens in indigenous communities is that you can have multiple generations living in a home. You could, you could have people that are not related to you living in your home. For a period of time, my grandmother, after her husband died with my step-grandfather, um, she lived in our house for like three months. I slept on the couch, she slept in, in my bed. Um, but there was no flexibility in our family growing or shrinking. And th this is the case of, of many indigenous families. So um, I took this hit the student's uh, graphic and put my house in it as well as, as an example. And I could just keep you know, adding to this, this list. Um, but this, this is a plan of a house that's, that was built in, in South Dakota, and I will tell you it is almost literally the same plan of my house. Um, I will say this is a fancy version, though, because it has a master bedroom. We only, our bath, we only had one bathroom for, for four people. Um, my bedroom was so small, I could only fit a twin bed in it, um, and this is when I decided to become an architect. I was doing my, my architectural drafting homework from high school. I was sitting on the edge of my bed doing it. There was no place for me to, to, to do my homework. So how are any of us supposed to succeed if that's not, that, that's not part of our um, sort of space? And so in my proposal, I said, I want this thing to be everything my HUD house wasn't and didn't have. My HUD house didn't have a view to the sky. My HUD house didn't have a place for a fire. It didn't have a porch. It didn't have a, a good connection to the earth. It didn't have a place for my non-human relatives. Um, and so this was a, these were the renderings that we did um, of the project uh, before it was uh, installed. And we um, completed it and was opened in August of last year. Uh, it's still there. Um, I, to be honest, I don't actually know what the end date of, of the exhibition itself as it keeps keeps changing. But I built it out of these basically two modules. Um, and so the one module, you enter from the east. Most indigenous dwellings, you enter from the east because that's where the sun rises. You always greet your visitors from, from that. Um, I wanted to make apertures in it that um, accommodated different body sizes and types. Um, and it has these sort of ledges in it, uh, hoping that birds would make nests within it. As architects, we spend a lot of time trying to keep birds off our buildings. Why aren't we making uh, habitats for them? Uh, this is a, the better way for us to coexist. Um, and if they become a nuisance, then, then we n should naturally deal with that. Maybe we need to introduce other predators. Um, buildings are the second leading cause of death for birds um, after their natural predators. Uh, so what if we thought about, uh, thought about those things? Um, a, as well. So this one has a hearth because that's where the place of, uh, for the fire is. So I couldn't, I didn't have the budget to build a sort of masonry thing. So I built this frame uh, and I clad it in the copper mesh. Uh, that's the same copper mesh that was on the trickster. I did a second trickster for another exhibition. So both uh, pieces are, are there and I plan to, to take that back and keep reusing it um, on, on different pieces. So this, this house has a, has a place for a fire. Uh, my house has regalia. It has the regalia of my culture uh, on it. So what if I started to apply that regalia to the architecture again? These are um, jingles that are placed on, on women's jingle dresses. It started in the Ojibwe culture, um, but they're, they're ways of waking up the world. Uh, so when women have these on their dresses, and even when they're walking, you can hear them. So when they're dancing, you can definitely hear them. But what if, what if the, the architecture could, could coexist in that way? Um, I'm trying to let light in in different ways. It's not, instead of this sort of weird sliding window that I had in my HUD house that seems to show up in, in all the others, um, what if I let light in different ways? Then you can see the view to the sky. Um, and it is intended to resonate with what indigenous architecture was, right? There's almost always a view to the sky that is associated with the fire. Um, and people were building dwellings that you could have fires in uh, without the smoke building up inside the space. Um, this is what I'd call, I wish I had invented the term, but it's what is called indigenuity, right? It's, it, people understood uh, the architecture to exist in the environment in a way that, that uh, facilitated your daily living, your centers of government, centers of religion and culture and, uh, and, and ceremony all happen within that. So this, this house is intended to do that. Um, and so again, like the other work, um, I rendered these things with, with my non-human relatives uh, in mind. And so this one is it in the snow. You can see the deers on the porch and there's a snow owl in the, um, in the, in the top of the hearth and it's using it to, to um, hunt its prey. 
But one day when I was there on the site uh, during the installation, I found this. Um, there's deer footprints that are leading up to the porch and then they end. So either the deer went into the actual thing or ran across the porch. Um, someone else sent me an Instagram video of deer running up to the thing. I think that that's when our non-human relatives see these things as friendly, right? They know that they're uh, intended to uh, be partners with them. Um, and so we should be thinking of that. I'll, I'll share one other story of the Indian Community School. So um, one of the other projects I worked in that, in that 20 years, we, I designed a boardwalk that goes uh, from the building out into the wetland. And part of that whole sort of process was scraping the pond, um, the state DNR said, well, anything you scrape, you have to keep on site. All of that is they sort of keep that as a, an ecological system. But when construction began and there's you know, these two huge machines that, that these two gentlemen were, were running, um, I just told them um, that you know, when you're using this machine in this landscape, understand that you're disturbing someone's home um, and that you're displacing uh, other living things and we had the students at the school explain to our non-human relatives in that place that we are going to disturb your home but it's only to make it better so if you go away please come back uh, and that has happened uh, it becomes a sort of thriving landscape it's a simple thing that we should be just thinking about right is is how how are our non-human relatives being affected uh, by these things um, and for me that's that's a larger understanding about um, about empathy, right, and, and how we should be thinking about uh, our world and, and, and how we should be empathetic in, in the ways that we um, uh, design things in our physical landscape. Yabako, thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was a great presentation. And um, we'll welcome both Chris and uh, Aaron up. I think if you just want to sit up here, I can move some chairs um, for a panel with questions. So uh, if you have any questions for Aaron or Chris, uh, submit them using this QR code. Um, and we'll be reading those out loud. Give us one minute to get set up. So we, are we starting with the audience questions? We have one question. Sorry. I turned it off. Okay. Uh, we actually have one question already. Um, so uh, indigenous communities have always designed beyond us in their art and architecture. In what ways does indigenous architect architecture inherently take into account all species in design or our non-human relatives? Well, it's, it's about all living things. And so when we think about that, we might think about the things that have legs, wings, scales, right? But it's also plants and trees, the things we would use as material. Um, and thinking about that as our relatives sharing with us as opposed to being a resource, a commodity to be consumed, right? That So that's... I think the thing that is like um, ingrained in the way that we think about indigenous architecture. And so certainly we live in different times, but how could I begin to think about that in contemporary buildings? Meaning like, what is this thing made out of? Where did it come from? Who's making it? Uh, the people that live in the factory or live near the factory that this thing is being made in um, are all things that, that I should be thinking about um in the actual design of the of the of the thing and trying to be least harmful right um and i have my students read robin wall kimmer's book in particular the chapter on the honorable harvest where she specifically talks about how indigenous people um didn't take more than than needed um and and so when we're designing we should be thinking about it in that way um and, and, and the resources that are being deployed and implemented. And um, I, I think that there's a 
for me at least my observation there's a shift in even what we're calling sustainable architecture and sustainable architects into from being like ones that had used a lot of technology and gadgets and things uh, as opposed to who's using uh, the earth uh, and, and, and community and culture um, together. Do you have anything to add to that, Aaron? quote that I just read, um, actually in the Sonoran Desert at the High Desert Museum, but apparently it's um, by Henry Beston, and it's from the Outermost House, and he writes, we need another and a wiser and perhaps a more mystical concept of animals. We patronize them for their incompleteness, for their tragic fate of having taken form below ourselves, and then we err, we err. But this is the part that I'm really interested in. So they're not brethren, they're not underlings, they're not they are other nations caught with ourselves in the net of life and time. And I'm really fascinated by the idea of animals as other nations, and uh, including in the, con in the context of your talk and the kind of structures of nations, including with the confederacies and the, the federal. Um, structures. Yeah, it's, it, it's about understanding. Well, for me, it like extends. If I think about them as my relative, then I think about them as equal, right? And we're sharing in this. So they're like citizens within my nation too. And this is how we see them. I think, you know, I had this conversation, I had a wonderful conversation with Bruce Mao once, and he is like, because he had heard about how, how I'm talking about these things too, and he was like, you know, one of the worst things that kind of ever happened to humanity is in the book of Genesis where it says that human beings have dominion over all animals, right? Like setting up that hierarchical relationship just – sets us all up for the sort of, now everything is like, okay, <laughs> we're at the top of this and then everything is below us. Um, instead of us seeing like, okay, we're equals and we all contribute to this thing differently. Um, that's, that's, you know, and we're seeing effects of it. Maybe we're not so visible or um, we're thinking about th things that pollinate and bees and birds and other sorts of things. They're, they're feeling ramifications of these things in different ways um they're they're certainly seeing climate change differently um and but we have to i think treat them as 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 equal sort of citizens that don't operate in maybe the same system that we do right like they can't vote but they vote differently <laughs> they they tell us that things are going wrong uh differently we just have to be able to he hear and listen to that we're not so many meaning not just me as an indigenous person but all of us we're not so many generations from that world. Um, and so I think we still have that ability. We just have to hone it a little bit better. Thank you. Um, we have a question. What is your story? How does who you are lead you to this work? That's for both of you. Well, my, uh, I don't want to sound really pretentious, but my story was just in the New York Times. So if you want to go <laughs> look at that. Uh, few Sundays ago last month um, which I think they did a fantastic job of actually telling my story I will tell you too that like when I became an administrator I became the chair of a department uh, I was really kind of ashamed of my story for a very long time uh, the fact that it took me six and a half years to, to go through undergrad um, I used to be like oh, this is, I'm, I'm ashamed of that but I still got into like I got a C in my second year studio right um, but I still got into Ivy League grad schools. I went to UVA, I, you know, like that didn't stop me and it doesn't determine anyone else's future. But I also was very shameful of my just existence um, on in that house. Um, there are things I won't tell you about it, but there certainly, you know, when I grew up in that house, we had 40% unemployment. 100% uh, of my parents were unemployed, meaning both parents, right? Um, I had to exist long periods of time where the only meal, hot meal I got was free lunch at school. Um, but I was like, why, why do we create this sort of shame around that as opposed to like saying, okay, students, um, I understand that we all, and even in this room, that we all got to this place in a very unique way, and I'm not going to assume it's the same. And I feel like when I went to architecture school, it was all like, okay, everyone got to college here, and the, you all have to achieve in the same way, and everyone has to do the same thing, and everyone has to either go to grad school or go to good grad school or go out and 
get a job in an office and become a principal, blah, 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 right? Like, I feel like now as an administrator, I, I personally just feel like, okay, I'm going to tell students my story so that they understand that the chair of the department isn't just the person that's like making all of these rules uh, and standards that, but, it, but in reality is, is more about like, how do we, how do we achieve excellence? Like, how do I get every student um, to, to achieve excellence, no matter what your background is, and so that you don't feel um, sort of shameful of that. But that's a long version. But, um, but for me, like I said, in the living in that community, I think that started, started to shape why I wanted to be an architect, and it is how I decided uh, I wanted to do that uh, within that uh, environment. And Aaron, we also want to hear from you. Why are you interested in this work? Well, I, I think that my family has been really important in rooting me in science and nature and also the kind of the, the work of thought. Um, I, I think I feel like my work is inseparable from growing up, uh, doing, following my dad around and doing uh, field work biology and my mom with environmental philosophy and now my brother doing fisheries ecology. I will say that it was a big scandal in my family when I dis when I proposed to go into architecture. <laughs> um, it's that it's it's architecture to that world of um, of environmental conservation and kind of reverence for um, the not built. Um, it's felt like a big threat that I was going to go sell my soul to the to the developers. Um, and I also around at that time I, I grew up in these the, these watersheds and these forests and mountains and, and whatnot. Um, also ran when ran from this place looking for um, other ways of thinking about design and 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 it's really nice to be back in many uh, ways of of what what that means to these um, ecosystems and families and also to connect the different things that I care about, design and this kind of complexity. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question from the crowd. Do you have any thoughts on how we could decolonize existing structures such as those on college campus? I'm sorry, um, did you say on this campus or any uh, campus? Any campus. Any campus. Decolonize existing structures. So I'm not sure if it's like physical structures or ideological structures. Uh, I would assume built structures. Huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, I would say if, you know, if for me it's bigger ideological structures that then should be reflected in the physical structures. Let me think of a good way to how we should be doing that. Because um, it's really hard. <laughs> I'm just thinking about architecture schools, right? Like, this is, I might go on a tangent, but I think that there, in its conception, there was something inherently wrong with the jury review system, but it's not flawed. I believe in it. I truly believe in it. Because if we see it as a conversation that the student is facilitating and that there is expertise that the jurors are bringing and we're all sharing it, that's how we should be thinking about it. Like how do we, how do we make this project better and how do we educate this student in a conversation and not in a judgment, right? We, so jury is, might be the wrong term to use, but I, I believe in the format. Um, and I also believe to some extent in the studio format where you have the, a similar thing. However, it's that like desperate world that I have been resisting as an instructor for a very long time. I tend to facilitate studios as conversations as a group uh, and then we sort of talk about your sort of projects as opposed to saying, well, I'm gonna go from desk to desk and tell you like this, this thing was the fire stairs, you can't get out of here, everyone's gonna die. Let's figure this out, like any of that stuff. But you still have to learn that stuff. But th I think there are other ways of, of, of understanding that. That's, 
I think that we just have to acknowledge that these systems exist and how can we find ways of bre breaking down barriers that are respectful, uh, you know, between one another. Um, so that's the ideological sort of uh, structure of, of colonization. It is a big apparatus uh, that I am personally trying to dismantle and, and reassemble as being an administrator in these in these systems. Also, I uh, um, was a victim of these like gates, uh, meaning like I had to have a certain GPA. That's why it took me six and a half years. Like, okay, now my faculty don't really know this, but I'm going to tell you. So student, like, they have to have a C plus in studio, which I think is kind of ridiculous when a second year studio, but they do. And uh, I told advising, tell the students if they do get a C, let's say, they can come talk to me uh, because I actually have the power to say, okay, you can go and do that. <laughs> um, and they do. And when, I, when they do that, I ask them about what, you know, why did this happen? Is there something going on in your life or your situation? Um, and then I talk to their instructor and I look at the work. Um, I'm trying to get a bigger picture of that particular individual other than that just C versus C plus. Um, so that's how I'm trying to dismantle those sort of systems that are uh, making barriers for students. Because who am I to judge as a 19 year old whether or not they want to do architecture? And if people continue to judge me that way, I wouldn't be where I am. Like I would, I don't know what I'd be doing. Um, but, uh, but I think we can do that. I do think that there's, we should be having discussions about the, the spaces that we have and how they're physically set up and how, what kinds of things do they facilitate. Um, you know, like this, this room, like most universities, every university's got one of these, right? Um, and it probably sits empty, I don't know, 90% of the time. Um, but when it's here, it's full. Uh, but what, how can we think about this space differently? Um, or any of the spaces in any of our buildings differently. Um, that's, that's, I don't know, I think that that's how we could begin to think about it, but I, for me it starts with the students and faculty and the people uh, and, and how they interface with one another and, and how can we extend that into the sort of physical landscape and, and building. I, I think that Built structures are also organizational structures, reflect value systems fundamentally. I think that uh, that in no uh, that um, academia or even a public institution is is a reflection, including here in this place on Kalapuya land, is a reflection of a kind of a wh white patriarchal um, institution uh, on foundations of colonialism and resource extraction, and and where the built environment and the institutional structures reflect that or are artifacts of that, they can also perpetuate it. And I think the most important beginning point for turning things around is to see it, to not think about especially academic space as neutral space and not think about universities necessarily as neutral space, but understanding the kind of reflection and perpetuation of value systems that exist as a way then of starting to purposefully shape them moving forward. I also think that cultural representation on campuses is fundamentally important, and so I really appreciate your work in the, the physical land acknowledgement. And I think we've been, um, it's a thing here <laughs> but, um, in, in many ways. Okay, so we'll take the last question for the panel. What is the single most important point of your work that you want your audience to take away from today? <laughs> well, here's the, the bumper sticker t-shirt slogan, whatever. Indigenous people are not invisible people. Like I deserve to be regarded in this discipline as an expert, and that's what I've always been trying to do. I've, to be honest, there was a long time in my career where I told students this story. Uh, I was recently a juror for an award that I couldn't get uh, for many years um, because I didn't think people just didn't value my work, um, and that has slowly started to change. But there's still, I think, some venues that that happens. But we can't get more indigenous people into the profession if people like me are, they can't see the examples of, of, this is also one of the reasons why I stood up and took on this chair role. 
um, because UNM is, we have a, a large indigenous student population. Um, and the 25 students that I've got in that building need to know that they have a sort of connection to the person leading the department that they don't have anywhere else. Um, yeah, for me it's like, just we're not extinct, <laughs> basically. I really appreciate the theme of hopes in general in the, the kind of mo more than human focus. And I guess I would encourage um, that I, I don't want to kind of um, acknowledge the importance about thinking of more than human and, and multi species uh, work as it relates to art and design and architecture and encourage folks to think about other species or other animals not as separate individuals but in terms of the relationships and the inseparability that um, that reflects. I keep thinking about the the work of some of our colleagues in microbiology here that show us that you can't really draw a biological line between one individual and another because we are many we are multi-species organisms in ourselves thinking about you know beyond gut microbiome and that when we walk by one another we're sharing this microbiome um, and I think that that um, ma matters enormously when we're talking about multi-species design that we're not necessarily thinking about a lot of individuals but we're thinking about relationships between and inseparability or as I was reading and I don't have an attribution for this but as as I as an animal look at another animal there's a third animal in between and I think that um, just to emphasize that um, these are great questions. Um, we'll take one more from Adrienne Parr, because she's the dean, and then we will go to lunch. <laughs> I, I, I really did not mean to create an exceptional space, <laughs> but um, I've been quietly sitting here eagerly waiting for a moment to ask a question. So um, I loved the, the emphasis on relationality that came out in both of your talks, and that's something that I, I feel very strongly about as well. So we share that in common. Um, but I'm always sort of struggling with, you know, the, the built form as 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 an entity that, and you've both sort of talked about it in different ways, as an entity that comes onto the land and it has, you know, gravitational weight to it that's about it standing up, lasting a long period of time, and that inherently invokes a particular kind of value schema of domination and you've both sort of addressed that and then the the tension that arises is the ways in which in relationality it's about how you touch something and as you touch it that touch is a kind of massaging it's 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 something that's open to reciprocity um, and that seems counter to the ways in which we have traditionally understood and taught and practiced architecture. That moment which the building touches the surface, the moment which the building touches the air and is open to the sky. And how do we kind of continue to move forward in this space, which a lot of the work that you showed is ephemeral in many senses and that's where its poetics and its beauty and its reciprocity and its relationality comes forth but as we continue forward as a species that's continuing to overpopulate the earth you know we're now at eight billion people and i'm thinking back to the chapter that you have your students focus on about not harvesting more than you need and we're now needing 1.5 earths in order to survive um, and that changes depending on what country you live in too, with US being the one needing the most Earths <laughs> in order to get by. Um, what does that do for architectural practices of the future? Because a lot of the ways in which that relationality plays out is about ephemerality, is light to touch on the ground, um, and it, it runs counter to the sort of the value systems of, you know, permanent and weight that has defined architecture for so long. Yeah, I think it's a, y you said it, I think, and to be honest, it's it's less about, it's really about reciprocity. It's about like, if I put this building here, what am I displacing and how do I give back to it, right? Like if I'm, 
putting roof here, that that's surface that is no longer receiving water. And so if I'm using that surface now, um, should I be collecting the water that would normally go to that surface, like Aaron's project with the, I think that was really an amazing thing where, okay, let's make another habitat for, for things that do need that water. Um, and But the even the light touch is one where it's just like, I'm still displacing, but I'm displacing less, right? Like it's reducing the amount of harm, but there's less reciprocity in that. Um, and how do I know when that that's the right place to put the thing <laughs> as well? Um, I won't get into specifics, but I do s will say that both the Indian Community School, large institutional project, it stretches almost a quarter of a mile from one end to the other. Um, we, with the school and community, ceremonially asked the land for permission. Uh, and this is something I do on every project. I don't photograph it, I don't document it, I don't talk about it much, but but I have to know that the land is ready to receive this thing, and it's my personal responsibility to make that the best gift to that place that I can. Uh, and that's that's you know my sort of responsibility to do that. And I try to do it in this reciprocal way. Um, and that's, you know, if I'm making habitats instead of displacing habitats, um, I kind of want to know that. I wish I was a more, had more scientific knowledge to know to, it, the way that I have building knowledge to be able to do that. But that's where we try to bring in experts to help me understand that before we start making these sort of like building moves. Like, would the school ever have a high school on that site? I don't know. They don't even know. But if we were to do that, what, what are the things we need to think about? Uh, within that system, I think it for me it's it's the idea of reciprocity um, and giving something back in this thing. It's not a thing that I'm taking or I'm just placing. Yeah, I think I also think you made a lot of really good points. I think I and I agree about the importance of anchoring in a kind of the the constant change and under uh, with a curiosity and a interest in the the kind of constantly changing physical world. So in the practice of architecture, anchoring in a true understanding of materiality and probably also um, uh, the natural s natural sciences, including biology and e ecology. And then also, and I think specifically for students of architecture, thinking about drawing and the inherent temporal context of drawing. Uh, I, it's very uncomfortable to draw one moment and so how can drawing layer the time and think about past, present, and future? And I, I, I really love your drawings and feel like they, I have no concern that we're only looking at one moment when I see them. Wonderful, all great questions. We had a lot of questions submitted that we unfortunately don't have time to ask all the questions. We encourage you during the lunch hour to go up and ask Aaron and ask Chris your questions. Have some great dialogue. Um, now we're gonna take a break for some lunch um, and then we'll come back for our next panel with uh, Megan Hayes and Sarah Gunawan.